Welcome to the Autumn 2020 edition of the Angus Connect Research and Development Update, where we at Angus Australia bring to you some of the latest research and development outcomes that could assist you in improving your herd's rate of genetic progress. Tonight, there's a real focus on products and tools which have ultimately come out of these research and development activities we've been involved in in the past. And it's this transition from research into a practical product you can take and apply within your breeding program that's a real focus of tonight's discussions. Whilst tonight's sessions have been pre-recorded, tomorrow there's a series of discussion sessions on each of the presentations. Anyone's welcome to join and have their questions answered and discuss any of the content delivered as part of the presentations in more detail. To participate in the discussion sessions, simply visit the Angus Australia website and click on the Angus Connect banner on the home page, where you'll be taken to a registration page for the discussion sessions. The discussion sessions will be hosted through Zoom, um, which you can access either through your computer or through a phone. The sessions will begin at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning and we look forward to seeing you there. G'day, we are the Neogen Australasia Green Team. And we are part of Australia's largest local genomics lab. With team members all over the country. We've been helping Angus breeders get the best from their animals since the adoption of DNA testing. We're proud to support your benchmarking program. And looking to the future with you, with tests like our new Hepa Select. So even in times like these, when the world's gone a little crazy. We're still testing and sending results to producers every single day. So get in touch with us to discuss how genomics can take your herd to the next level. One, one sample, sample, one simple, simple comprehensive, comprehensive solution. solution. The first session tonight looks at some exciting developments in the genomic space as we explore the genomic opportunities available to commercial breeders. There are a number of presentations as part of this next session and we begin as Andrew Byrne contexts later presentations with a discussion around how we calculate genomic breeding values for commercial animals. So when we start considering the genomic options for the genetic evaluation of commercial animals, it's important to firstly go back and reflect on how the basis of genetic evaluation and the prediction of breeding value works. So for some time in, in um, the Australian beef industry, we've been able to uh, predict the breeding value of seed stock animals. And that prediction of breeding value has been possible based on a couple of key fundamentals. First of all, we need to understand the relationship between animals. And then we use the information that's available on animal and the animals to which it's related to predict its breeding value or, or to estimate its genetic merit. Now in the past, um, all that we had available to enable us to estimate or, or understand the relationship between animals was the pedigree information which was recorded. So on seed stock animals, the sire, the dam, um, any information about their progeny, etc., enabled the uh, genetic evaluation software to go through and, and estimate the breeding value. And one of the things which has evolved uh, over the last uh, couple of um, decades really, but certainly in the last 10 years in, in a um, very um, increasing speed and, and very um, quick way, is that we can now use genomics or DNA technology to um, better understand or estimate the relationship between two particular animals. And that suddenly means that we can start to predict the breeding value for animals on commercial animals. So where we have animals that, that don't have any pedigree information, so we don't necessarily know who this are and the dam are, we can take a DNA sample and start to um, look at their relationship to other animals and use any information that's available to predict their breeding value. Of course, the, the DNA in itself only allows us to understand um, what the relationship is between two animals. The actual prediction of breeding value relies on the existence of some, of some information. So by that I mean the existence of what we'll call a genomic reference population. Just to explain that a little bit further, um, if we look at a genomic profile for an animal, so we, we take a, a hair sample or we, we take a, um, a tissue sample out of the tear, um, we send that off to the DNA lab, then what the, the genotyping process does is it returns a, a DNA profile on those animals. And if we look at all the DNA profile in itself, it's not very informative. It's just a series of, depending how it's expressed, either a, a C, G, um, A or T, a series of um, letters, or often converted into a series of A's and B's. And the animals, um, depending on the, the different DNA platform, 
um, we get a, the series of these uh, letters um, around 50,000 of those. So it looks at 50,000 places um, in, in a lot of our technology that's available today across the animal's DNA. Now that in itself is, is not informative at all at, at describing the animal's breeding value. Um, but what is informative is, is it enables us to go through and look at the genetic relationship that that animal has to these animals in the genomic reference population. And the genomic reference population is really a group of animals that have um, been comprehensively performance recorded from conception right through to slaughter um, and have DNA information on them. And by understanding the relationship between um, the animal and those animals in the, the uh, genomic reference population, then we can start to use the information on those animals to predict the um, breeding value of that commercial animal. Um, now the value of that prediction, so how accurately that can be, um, the breeding value can be predicted, is dependent on a number of key factors. And, and factors such as the size of the reference population. Generally, the, the more animals in that reference population, the more performance records, the more reliably that breeding value can be predicted. It's also impacted by things around how closely the animal is um, to, to the animals that exist within that reference population. So the more closely related an animal is, the better the prediction is of, of its total breeding value. Um, Likewise, the value of the phenotypes or the performance information that's been collected on animals in that reference population in describing genetic differences. So for traits which are what we call lower heritability, so less of the differences in the, the performance is due to genetic differences, so traits like uh, fertility, then we need a lot more information in a lot more animals in that reference population to predict breeding value um, than, than say a high heritability trait, such as our weight and our, our carcass traits. It's also how relevant the performance information is that has been collected on those animals in the reference population in the, in the production systems in which we're trying to select animals for. So if we have, um, ideally, we have um, performance measurements in the production system with which we're trying to select cattle. So all of those different things come into it. One of the things in the Angus breed which we um, are very fortunate to have, and it's due to the, the foresight um, of particularly the, the board of directors of Angus Australia and the, and the manager of Angus Australia, uh, 10 to 15 years ago, is that we have the Angus Sire Benchmarking Program. So the Angus Sire Benchmarking Program, um, initially set up as, as a young sire uh, program to, that goes through and effectively uses fixed time AI um, uh, breeding technology to uh, test 40 young sires, 40 to 50 young sires in commercial operations across Australia each year. Um, it's now in its 11th year, so just joining its, its 11th uh, cohort of animals. And what that has done by having a, a really comprehensively well-recorded um, um, population of animals, particularly for hard-to-measure traits, all with DNA information, it, is de it has uh, developed and is delivering a really relevant, high-value genomic reference population for Angus breeders in Australia and really enabling us now to start to make available genomic tools for the prediction of, of breeding value of commercial animals in the Angus breed. And if we delve into that a little bit more and start to look at well, what is that Angus genomic reference population and how large it is, it is, a, I should say, a combination of information which has been collected on animals in the Angus Sire benchmarking program, but also the information which has been collected by breeders in, in the seed stock industry over time. And the relative information de depends on the different traits. So within our genomic reference population now, um, we have around, um, and it's growing all the time, but around uh, 70 to 80,000 animals with, with DNA information and then they've been recorded for a range of different information. So for, for easy to measure traits, like the, the weight traits, um, that reference population now is, is up in the kind of 40,000 and above. Um, for some of the carcass traits and, and the harder to measure traits, um, then, then it's a, a lot lower. But for those hard to measure traits, pretty much based on, on the information which has been collected or entirely in the Angus Sire benchmarking program, we're now getting a reference population up to around three and a half to, to 4,000 animals. And that's of a size because of the really um, high quality nature of that performance information and the relevance of those animals to, to the commercial animals that we're trying to test um, to, to really deliver some accuracy into the genomic predictions which we can make on uh, commercial animals. Um, so the take home message out, out of that when we start to look at it is um, that genetic evaluation for commercial animals is now a reality. Um, and Angus Australia, in, in collaboration with our, our DNA companies, our gene typing partners in uh, Zoetis and, and Neogen, are really focused on the provision of genetic evaluation services uh, for not only uh, Australian uh, seed stock animals, but now also for commercial Angus animals in, um, in the beef industry. 
And ultimately why we're, we're focused on that um, from, from an Angus Australia perspective is so that we're better describing the, the genetics of both seed stock and commercial animals so we can make more accurate selection decisions and ultimately continue to improve um, the profitability of Angus genetics right through the beef supply chain. And there's consequently a, a range of um, options now available for commercial producers um, to get um, prediction of breeding value of their, those animals. So we have um, some, some genomics only services such as Angus Heifer Select, uh, which is currently available, Angus Steer uh, Select, which is, is under development, and also the, the recording of animals on the Angus Performance Register uh, for those that, that want a little bit more information. We run 520 Angus breeding cows. You know, both our sons work for us. They're skilled operators on most machinery and that now, and they're really good around the cattle because they've been doing it since they were small kids. So Angus Heifer Select is a genomic selection tool to help inform the selection of Angus replacement heifers in a commercial Angus beef enterprise. It's available for females that are straight bred Angus, so by straight bred Angus, greater than um, 87.5 or, or 7 eighths Angus content. So Angus Heifer Select, how it works, is based on a, a DNA sample. So we collect a, a DNA sample, being either tail hairs or a uh, tissue sampling unit, or a, a TSU, which is an ear notch. Um, then we can go through, based on that, and provide a genetic prediction of the animal's breeding value for nine important maternal growth and, and carcass traits. Also a genetic prediction for total breeding value um, associated with a, an overall star rating. Um, an optional is, is also if we have DNA uh, profiles on the size of those heifers is to pr uh, provide sire assignment. So if heifers have been joined in a, in a multi-sire breeding program, we know who the possible sires are. If we have DNA profiles on those, then uh, we can use the DNA to, to identify who the individual sire of each heifer is. Likewise, we also have the option with Angus Heifer Select of adding um, BVD testing as well. Um, so it's an example heifer uh, select results. Uh, if we look here at a, a group of, um, of heifers which have been tested with Angus Heifer Select, we can see we, we have the year of birth, the, the sire ID, um, identifying the individual sire of those heifers, along with um, their genetic predictions um, for the individual traits and total breeding value and the, the heifer select stars. Um, so why test with Angus Heifer Select? And there, there's a range of different benefits with which um, we might be able to, to use um, the Heifer Select results. Ultimately what Angus Heifer Select does is describe the genetics of those females. And that enables us to go through and make more informed female selection decisions and to identify those females which have the genetics which are most closely aligned with our breeding objective. So that enables us to, if we're um, going through our replacement heifers, to ensure those heifers which we're retaining within our breeding program are those with the highest genetic merit. Or likewise, we can, if we're culling those females, we can make sure we can cull females with inferior genetics or, or those genetics which are uh, less aligned with our breeding objectives. In some scenarios, people are using Angus Heifer Select to draft those females into different production systems. So if they're, they're running a, um, a straight bred Angus breeding program alongside an F1 Angus Wagyu breeding program, um, then they can go through, better understand the genetics of those females, particularly uh, for traits like marbling and draft those females into and use them in the different production systems to which their genetics are aligned. Ultimately what Angus Heifer Select is doing, as I said, is, is enabling us to make more informed selection decisions. So alongside the other sources of information which we're currently using in, in a lot of commercial operations um, to identify and, and select our replacement heifers, so things alongside their weights, their, the structure of those animals, um, the temperament or docility of those animals. We can combine all those different sources of information to um, make more informed uh, selection decisions regarding the, the heifer replacements that we use in our production systems. Likewise, we can, by better understanding the genetics of those females, we can help inform our, our future bull uh, purchasing decisions. So we can identify what the relative uh, strengths and weaknesses of the, the genetics in our female herd are, and therefore tailor and, and really target bulls, um, which can um, better, um, get better genetics of our female herd going forward. Um, one of the other things by identifying individual size um, of those heifers is enables us to, to better understand bull reproductive performance. So we know in, in a lot of multi-sire joining programs, um, 
that some individual bulls get the majority calves, others get less calves, and in some cases, some get no calves. So by understanding how many progeny by each sire they're represented within that group of heifers, then we can really start to understand the, the reproductive performance of those bulls. By understanding pedigree or the sire information of those animals, we can start to manage inbreeding better um, within, within a commercial operation. And there's also marketing opportunities which it presents. So if we have the, the genetics of our females described, then if we're trying to uh, sell those animals, then uh, we can market it with the Angus Heifer Select information um, and, and have a marketing advantage when trying to sell those. Um, likewise, if we're trying to market their steer progeny, then we have some idea of what the genetics of those females are and can describe them. So the Angus Heifer Select results are all um, reported in a, in a different fashion to the traditional uh, breeding values or EBVs that are produced within the Trans-Tasman Angus Cattle Evaluation. Um, so they're reported as an intuitive uh, 0 to 100 score. So that they range between 0 to 100 for each trait, where a value of 50 represents the average genetic merit of, of other commercial heifers who've been tested with Angus Heifer Select. They are com comparable across different herds, so we, we can use it to see where those heifers fit uh, relevant to, or relative to, to all those other heifers which have been tested in other herds with Angus Heifer Select. And the higher values, so that the value is closer to 100 compared to zero, that the higher um, the genetic prediction for a particular trait identifies and indicates females which are predicted to be carrying genetics that will produce more of that trait. So be it more weaning weight, um, more mature cow weight or, or more milk, um, so higher mature cow weight, higher milk, and then we can go through and identify, um, I guess, based on the description of those traits, uh, which females are carrying the genetics which are most aligned with your breeding objective. So if we understand that the traits for which um, genetic prediction are provided, uh, there, are, there are a range of traits relating to um, attributes which affect the profitability of the cow-calf breeding enterprise. So we, we have uh, calving ease direct, um, giving an indication of differences in calving difficulty in, in two-year-old heifers. Um, weaning weight or differences in, in the weight of progeny um, at, at 200 days due to the, the growth genetics um, of those females. Likewise, the milk uh, genetic prediction, which is giving us differences in the, the weaning weight or 200-day weight of the calves um, from, these, from females due to the differences in the maternal uh, attributes or, or the milk, milking ability of those females. Yearling weight, so differences in, in the weight of their progeny at, at 400 days due to their genetics for growth. And mature cow weight, differences in, in their weight um, at maturity or standardised to a, a five-year breeding female due to their genetics. Alongside the, the cow-calf traits, we also have um, some traits which relate, four traits which relate to the um, different profitability of, of Angus animals in, um, for, for carcass attributes. So we have carcass weight um, giving us uh, differences in the progeny in terms of dress carcass weight at, at 750 days of age. Eye muscle area, so differences in, in a standard uh, carcass, uh, differences in, in the size of the eye muscle in their, their progeny. Likewise, rib fat uh, in a standard carcass, differences in the fat depth at their rib site. And likewise, intramuscular fat or, or marbling, differences in, in a standard carcass in the amounts of marbling that we'll see in the progeny from a heifer. So there's, there's nine traits um, across the, the um, different parts of the production system. Alongside of those, also within Angus Heifer Select, use a, a total breeding value, which goes through and weights those different traits um, to come up with a prediction of, of those heifers who will, um, in, in most, in the majority of uh, commercial grain and, and grass finishing production systems, reflect the, those with the genetics which are most aligned with improving overall profitability. And that total breeding value is reported in two ways. It's reported um, on a 0 to 100 scale, but also as a star rating. So on a 0 to 5 stars, um, based on their overall profitability of their genetics. Um, Angus Heifer Select results are, are all reported via a powerful online report centre. Um, so that, that powerful online report centre enables you to go in and, and access the results on any heifers which you've been able to uh, attest with Angus Heifer Select. It also has um, some, some kind of interactive slider bars and filters which enable you to put in your desired selection criteria and really easily identify those heifers which, which are carrying the genetics which are aligned with your breeding objective. Likewise, there's, there's a comprehensive report centre which enables you to, to really go through and analyse those results and scrutinise the genetics on any particular group of heifers which you've tested. 
So things like the, the trait comparison report, which enables you to, to plot the, the distribution of animals um, for two particular traits. Um, so whether we're balancing up carving ease with marbling, for instance, um, or sail weight with, with marbling, um, we can go through it and start to identify those that, that are carrying genetics that might be favourable for both those traits at the same time. Um, and within that, we, we can go through on the, the distribution. We can select individuals, we can highlight different groups, and they will come out in an associated report that we might select for use within our breeding program. Likewise, simple trait distribution reports, which enable us to, to see the distribution that we have um, for the different breeding values, uh, genetic predictions uh, for each particular trait. So how accurate are the um, Angus Heifer Select genetic predictions? And that's a, that's a really um, key thing that we need to consider. So we're starting now as, um, to be able to go in and based on a, a DNA sample, predict the breeding value of, of commercial animals um, for dif these different traits. And if we look on, on the graph, um, then, then it really depends on whether those animals have a sire identified as not, as to what the level of accuracy is. So where we have a, a sire, an individual sire has been identified, um, then the, the um, accuracy of the Angus Heifer Select genetic predictions is, is around the equivalent of if we had a, a normal EBV in the trans-Tasman Angus cattle evaluation of around 45 to, to 50%. So starting to get up to, to a really um, a level where it's a reliable breeding value. If there's no sire information, then, it, then it, we're more down in that um, 30 to 35% range of the accuracy of those. So it's still well above the, um, the minimum accuracy thresholds uh, which are used in the, the Trans-Tasman Angus cattle evaluation for the publishing of EBVs, so that they still be considered um, quite reliable breeding values, particularly when we're, we're trying to select groups of animals. But if we're trying to maximise the accuracy of these genetic predictions, then having a, an individual sire identified is, is um, a really key thing to consider. If by comparison we put in the, the accuracy and look, well, how do the, um, the accuracy of the Angus Heifer Select genetic predictions um, compared to the breeding values being produced within the Trans-Tasman Angus cattle evaluation, then you can see it, it depends on, on the trait, but the um, average accuracy, if we, if we look here, say, of um, animals born in uh, 2018 um, with uh, across the different breeding values, so the seed stock animals in Australia, we can see the accuracies are, are more around that uh, 55 to 60 percent range. So, the Angus um, heifer select values are, are below that, as we would expect, because we don't have performance information on these animals, but they're, they're still starting to approach um, similar levels of accuracy and are at a level of accuracy where we can use them in our selection uh, with confidence. Um, so the ordering process, if you're interested in um, accessing Angus heifer select, is first of all, you, you, Angus heifer select is only available to members of Angus Australia, so, so you need to to become a member um, to, to access this service. It's, it's commercialised and delivered to industry through Angus Australia. Get an Angus Australia and an Angus Heifer Select order form from the Angus Australia website. Get your DNA sample collection kits. So again, we can collect either hair or, or TSUs or using the Orflex TSU uh, sampling equipment. Um, really review and I encourage people to, to review the, the DNA profiles on any of those sires um, to, to, to check. And if you're buying um, registered bulls from a seed stock herd who is genomically testing those bulls, then, then that's all there for you. You can check that on the Australia website and those profiles can be used to assign the individual sires. Alternatively, you have the option if you've got a DNA sample on those bulls to genotype those through Angus Australia and that will facilitate the um, sire verification. So once we go through, you've got your DNA samples collected, filled in your order form, return those to Angus Australia, um, and Angus Heifer Select will be performed for you. Um, so Angus Heifer Select, which is important to reflect, is delivered to um, the Angus breeders in Australia in, in partnership with our genotyping um, partners, so Zoetis and, and Neogen. It can be ordered through Angus Australia from, from both those organisations. And those results which we are, are reporting on Angus Heifer Select are powered by the different genotyping technologies which are provided by those two companies. So the Angus Ultra Low Density in the, the case of Neogen, or the HD50K for Angus um, product for, for if it's tested by Zoetis. And of course, in association with the um, Angus Australia genomic reference population. So those three different sources of information are used in the production of those um, Angus Heifer Select values. And we're, we're proud to partner with both Neogen and Zoetis in delivering this product um, to commercial Angus breeders in Australia. Retail price is, is around $40, so $40.45 per animal if, if tested through Neogen, um, or $42.65 if the genotyping is done through Zoetis. 
If it's done through Negen with hair samples, then there is an additional $3.30 um, surcharge which does apply. For further information about Angus Heifer Select, um, there's a range of information on the Angus Australia website um, and also information available from staff at, at Angus Australia or the different genetic specialists with both Negen and Zoetis. We understand the importance of achieving the best possible outcome with assisted reproduction. That's why we at Vetiquinol have created Repro360. We partner with key industry stakeholders and provide extensive resources, services and technical information. This enables breeders, veterinarians and artificial breeding companies to have a holistic and collaborative approach to livestock reproduction. We offer a range of high-end veterinary products, along with professional support and practical solutions. Our specialised services and proven products are helping maximise success with assisted breeding programs around the country. Get in touch with our friendly team today. Multiply your outcomes and benefit from a partnership for life. The situation we're facing when looking at a group of steers or Angus steers um, is the variation we see within that group. Um, here's an example on the screen of 191 Angus steers that were long fed for the long fed high quality uh, market. Um, 200 plus days on feed and the variation we see um, for a range of traits uh, relevant to that production system. If we look at carcass weight for example, these steers averaged 191, 470 kilogram carcass weight. Again, they're long fed so they're heavy guys. Um, but the range was really um, great. We saw 607 kilograms maximum to 393 minimum. So there's a lot of spread there to look at and a, and a large standard deviation there as well. Um, the variation creates some issues in regards to uh, when we need to put those cattle in the production system because you want cattle maybe that fit a tight specification for male score or for carcass weight. And when we see this sort of variation, um, while it's good probably for selecting animals on a genetic perspective, it does create some issues from a commercial uh, production system basis. Um, here's another example of some variation we see, and these are just two bodies within a kill of about 100 steers. Um, body 238 was one steer. His carcass was 452 kilograms, marble score, Ozmeat 4, 740 MSA marbling, 105 square centimetres, eye muscle area. Whereas the other, other body in that kill, another steer, body number 216, was lighter, 418 kilogram carcass weight, less marbling, 2.5 and 380 MSA marble score, and about 10 square centimetres smaller in eye muscle area, so less muscle. So as you can imagine, the body number 238 was a much more valuable carcass with all those things combined compared to 216. Um, so how do we, we really need to understand that variation in more detail. And to do that, we need to appreciate uh, this next bit of information, which is what we see in the animal, it's phenotype. So what we end up getting is a combination of two things, which is the genetics the animal's carrying, half inherited from the sire and half from its mother, its dam, combined with the production system. So how the animal's been fed, um, and some other effects like the age of the cow, and is, it a, is it an old cow, is it a young cow, the age of the animal itself, all those sorts of things feed into it. Um, where this new product fits in, which is Steer Select, is helping us understand the genetic component of it on Angus Steers. So Steer, steer Collect estimates the genetics animals carrying just from its DNA, and it's a DNA product. To give you more information on Steer Select, um, it's a genomic based product to better inform management, including the drafting of Angus steers and the appropriate production systems. It's still under development, so we don't have it commercially released yet, but we're developing it in collaboration with our friends at CSIRO. They've got a great team of geneticists and, and commercial phenotyping people there. Um, so it's a collaborative agreement between uh, Angus Australia and CSIRO. It's underpinned by the Angus Australia reference population, particularly what we've been collecting the Angus Sire benchmarking program, um, coupled with the good genotyping platforms we have from Neogen and Zoetis. So we're lucky in that sense we've got good genotypes and we've got good phenotypes combined. Importantly, uh, this product will also see some real, real comprehensive validation stages for the in, in Australian production systems. So we're going to make sure this product actually works before we release it and that's the phases we're going through at the moment. 
Um, so just be aware of that and keep an eye out for the uh, validation as we go through. What we're looking to do at the moment is, the initial stages, produce genomic predictions for a range of traits relevant to steers, uh, particularly Angus steers. So if you look at on-farm, we've got something like yielding weight, we've got the feedlot, we've got average daily gain and dry matter intake. For the abattoir and the consumer particularly, we've got things like carcass weight, the marbling scores, eye-moss layer, rib front and oss ossification. And importantly, and this is uniquely what we've got available in Australia for Angus, is our health and welfare trait of immune index, which is our immune competence trait. Um, and we'll also be looking to put together some selection indexes around that as well. Um, still under development, but that's what we're looking at in the early stages. In regards to some really early validation of this product, um, you can see here what we've done is those 191 steers I talked about at the, at the start, we actually use as an independent validation population. So we developed the steer select product on our reference population in the Angus Sire Benchmarking Program. And we looked at this independent population of Angus steers where we actually used what we developed from that uh, calibration group to then validate it against these animals. So we, we calculated the genomic prediction for carcass weight on these animals. So all we knew is the genomic prediction. We didn't know anything else about these steers. Um, and we drafted them on those genomic predictions into their quartile. So the top 25% for carcass weight genomic prediction down to the bottom 25%. And as you can see there, the top 25% top or 48 steers out of 191 averaged 487 carcass weight. Um, compared to the other extreme of the population, uh, the bottom 25% there, 47 steers, average 455. So actually 32 kilograms, the top, the top percentile, 25%, were um, 32 kilograms heavier than the bottom percentile. Um, showing this product is useful um, using genomics alone to draft steers in those different systems. Um, when we look at it in a bit more detail, you can see there when we actually break it down into, court, um, into carcass weight ranges, and for example, if you look at the top quartile, the top 25% in 48 steers, you can see that 29% of those, for example, are between 500 and 550 kilogram carcass weight. Um, and 4% are above uh, 450 and 2% are above um, 575 carcass weight. Um, if you look at the graph, you can see proportionally where the carcass weight sits for the quartiles. So the red is the, the top quartile, and the blue is the bottom quartile and the other two in the middle there. And you can see most importantly that it does help to, to draft cattle for carcass weight based on their genomics. We still get some spread, so we're not picking all the animals up the top and all the end of the bottle and, and splitting them exactly. That's because there's a range of other factors affecting the carcass weight other than, than genetics. Things like the age of the animal, the herd, um, uh, things like that. The production system is similar for these cattle obviously because they're long fed. Um, but it's, being a very, it's becoming a very useful, looking like a very useful tool to help draft steers in these early validation stages. If you look at another trait like marbling score, and again we drafted those 191 steers on their MSA marbling score genomic prediction. Um, the top 25% for MSA marbling average 623, 3.8 um, for osmeat marbling, and we also took meat samples off these animals and got a carcass IMF and they were 13.2% through the lab, so we actually measured direct um, objective uh, uh, intramuscular fat, which is obviously related to marbling. The bottom 25% uh, were much lower in MSA marble score on average, 130 points lower, uh, 1.2 lower for osmeat marbling score, and importantly, 3.7% lower for intramuscular fat in the lab, so lower in all counts there on average as we'd expect. But similar to carcass weight, we saw some overlap there as well. So again, it didn't account for all the differences we saw, um, did account for a large percentage of those. For example, as you can see, the top 25 percentile there had 21% uh, of animals between MSA uh, grade of MSA marbling school grade of 700 to 800, and 8 percent above 800, accounting for most animals in that higher level. So again, the early validation is looking very, very, um, very promising. Um, but there's much more work to be done in this in this case as well, so we understand it in a bit more detail. So what are the next steps for this product? First of all, we're going to continue the collaboration with Syrah and keep developing this trait. We're going to further validate it with data we've collected from the Angus Eye Benchmarking Program, but also using industry animals. And we've actually got in line now to um, genomically test a thousand steers um, and maybe even more to, to look at these independent of our reference population to see how this product looks uh, in regards to managing and drafting Angus steers. Obviously we need to develop the commercialization, which is about the pipeline of the DNA coming in and out and the information. 
reporting back to the owners of those cattle and also the pricing needs to be worked on. Uh, we're also looking at regularly updating the steer select predictions. So as we get more information coming in, our reference population increases to update those predictions regularly. Uh, we're also looking at a feedback mechanism where we can potentially feed back commercial data into the reference population for those animals that have been genotyped. Now, not all data will be suitable, but we're looking at that as, a, as part of this program. And we're hoping all going to plan, contingent on the validation component, that this product will be available to the Angus industry in Australia in 2021. I would say a lot of the BRD that I get on my farm goes undetected. We find the best time to vaccinate is obviously at weaning and if we're trading cattle, it's when they arrive on our farm. Shield MH1, you only need one. So one option that's available to uh, commercial Angus breeders in Australia who are after genetic prediction of breeding value for, for their animals is to record those animals on the Angus Performance Register with Angus Australia. So the Angus Performance Register, it's, it's really for, designed for there for those commercial producers who want more information than um, is available from the Angus Heifer Select product. So Angus Heifer Select uh, provides genetic predictions for a, a limited range of traits, so, so nine different uh, traits. Um, those genetic predictions are, are not provided um, in the same form as a, a traditional estimated breeding value, so they're not directly comparable to the, the EBVs which are uh, published within the trans Tasman Angus cattle evaluation um, and, and that kind of thing. So the um, Angus Performance Register, it enables those producers um, who really want more than, than what is available from, from Angus Heifer Select um, to, to do that. Um, Angus Heifer Select is available at around $40 per animal. Uh, recording on the um, Angus Performance Register is, is more expensive than that, um, but it's in, around the, the value is also a lot higher. So the Angus Performance Register, um, it's available for both males, in, including uh, the recording of bulls and uh, females. Um, animals must be, or it's only available for, for animals which are 87.5% Angus or, or 7 8 Angus. Um, one key thing to note is it's only available for males, uh, so bulls which have been sired by a, a bull which is registered with Angus Australia. So only male progeny that, are, um, that, that are, have been sired by a registered sire. So really in programs where people are looking at multiplying the genetics of those registered sires, but either by a fixed time program um, or a natural mating program. Um, under the Angus Performance Register, um, based on, on a DNA sample that we collect on our animals, so again, either a tail hair sample or a, an all-flex TSU or tissue sampling unit, um, an e-notch, um, people can, can take those DNA samples, send them into Angus Australia, record the animals on the Angus Performance Register and receive Trans-Tasman Angus Cattle Evaluation EBVs for, for a full range of traits um, along with um, the four selection indexes. The advantages, I guess, of the uh, Angus Performance Register is those breeding values that are produced on those commercial animals are directly comparable to the EBVs of, of seed stock animals. So we look at some example results which are available for, for a, a commercial producer who has recorded animals on the Angus Performance Register. Here we have that the, the individual sire has been assigned. Uh, we have values for the four different selection indexes, so the Angus Breeding Index, Domestic Index, um, Grain Feed Index and, and Grass Feed Index and then EBVs for all the traits within the, the trans Tasman Angus cattle evaluation, with the exception of docility and the five structural soundness traits. So the results in recording animals on the Angus Performance Register is they um, include the, uh, those full EBVs and, and selection index values. Um, sire assignment, which is essential for, for males, so it's a compulsory requirement um, that we must, those males must be uh, DNA sire verified to um, a registered Angus sire. Um, to get uh, results via the Angus Performance Register. For females, that, that's not required, um, but, but is optional. So we can add in individual sire assignment, providing that uh, DNA profiles are available for those sires of those heifers. Um, there's also some add-on DNA testing, which can be added and, and done when recording um, with those animals on the Angus Performance Register um, by comparison to just EBVs. So you have the option of adding on uh, DNA testing for genetic conditions. Um, or for BVD or, or pestivirus. Um, so the benefits of recording animals on the, on the Angus Performance Register for, of recording um, commercial animals there, um, again, very similar um, benefits to recording animals with Angus Heifer Select. 
So really, the, if we're recording heifers on the Angus Performance Register, the overall benefit is we're, we're better describing the genetics of those heifers, so therefore we can make more informed female selection decisions and ultimately identify those heifers which are carrying genetics which are most aligned with our, our breeding objective. Um, by comparison to what, what's received out of Angus Heifer Select, we have additional traits, so that they're described for, for more traits which might fit into your breeding objective. Accuracy values are, are reported for, for each of those um, EBVs that, that come out. The EBVs are reported in real units, so we can start to, to use those EBVs not only to see where an animal um, fits within, within the po Angus population, but also to compare differences in, in what we might start to see in, in the progeny of those animals. And as I mentioned, um, they're also those EBVs are directly comparable to the EBVs produced on seed stock animals. Um, also, we have the other same benefits as, as what's delivered by Angus Heifer Select when we're describing the genetics of those females. It helps inform those future bull purchasing decisions, understanding our bull reproductive performance, so which bulls are, are getting calves and which ones aren't, and, and of those that are getting calves, which ones are getting mo the most calves, and enabling us to, to manage through, through sire verification um, and identification, um, identifying us to, to manage our inbreeding and, and um, alongside if we have our, the EBVs of our genetics described and we have EBVs available, then we can, can use that in uh, the marketing of those animals or the, or the marketing of their progeny. Um, on the bull side, recording bulls on the Angus Performance Register, again, um, enabling uh, you to describe the genetics of those bulls. So if we have, have a run of bulls that we're looking at, um, understanding what their genetics are, having that described enables us to or you to make more informed bull selection decision and ultimately um, identify those bulls which are more carrying genetics which are most aligned um, with your breeding objective, when, particularly when you are multiplying the, the genetics of registered sires. Um, some additional considerations when looking at recording animals on the Angus Performance Register as an option is we can you can do that testing just as one-off testing. Um, we, we send in the DNA sample, get back your, your EBVs and um, that, that's basically it. Alternatively, it does provide you with the option of leaving those animals active and continuing to record them on the Angus Performance Register, um, and that provides you with a, a, a range, the full range of services which Angus Australia provides, and, and including the ongoing recording of their progeny um, of those animals on the Angus Performance Register and the ongoing description of, of those via um, and access to, to estimated breeding values. They're also on the female side of things, you also have the option of recording performance information. So if you are collecting some performance measurements on, on farm, um, then you can also submit those on those females for, for increasing the accuracy of those EBVs. Um, in terms of who, who, what the Angus Performance Register, who, who can access that, um, it is recording animals on the Angus Performance Register is only available to Angus Australia members. So you need, need to become a member of Angus Australia if, if you're not already. Um, the Angus Performance Register, like a lot of the um, genomic kind of options for the genetic evaluation of commercial animals, is delivered by Angus Australia in partnership with um, our, our DNA genotyping companies, our partners in, in Zoetis and Neogen. So the results which are reported, the, the EBVs, are powered by, in, in the case of, of Neogen, the Angus GS genotyping platform, or in the case of Zoetis, the HD50K for, for Angus platform. So the genotyping for when recording animals on the Angus Performance Register, like Angus Heifer Select and Angus Deer Select, can be conducted through, through both our partner organisations. Um, and we're proud to, to partner with both of those organisations in the delivery of these products. Um, it's also those results are, are very much powered by the Angus Australia genomic reference population. So the genotyping uh, information along with the uh, comprehensive pedigree performance information which has been collected uh, predominantly through the Angus Sire benchmarking program and, and in industry um, that exists in the, for animals in that genomic reference population um, really powers the, the results which are coming out. As I said, the, the price of um, when recording on the Angus Performance Register is more than um, Angus Heifer Select. So um, if testing through Neogen, um, the, the results are available for a cost of $99.85. By Zoetis, um, that's around $103.15. Those prices are, are made up of a combination of the, the recording of those animals on the Angus Performance Register plus the, the DNA testing services. Uh, there is also a surcharge that's built into that price to cover access to the Angus genomic reference population um, and the utilisation of that performance information. If testing with hair samples through Negen, there's also an additional um, $3.30 surcharge. 
So the Angus Performance Register, um, along with Angus Heifer Select and, and Angus Deer Select, is really a, a demonstration that uh, genetic evaluation uh, for commercial Angus animals in Australia is, is now a reality. Um, we're at a stage now where the, the technology that's available enables the prediction of breeding value to, to a level. It's, it's conservative accuracy, but, but still useful accuracy. And uh, over time, um, the accuracy of these genomic products will continue to increase and, and become more useful into the future. So it's a really key focus now of, of Angus Australia um, in collaboration with our, our partners, Wes and Nijin, is providing these genetic evaluation services for Australian uh, commercial animals on top of what, what Angus Australia has done for a long time in the provision of genetic evaluations for Angus seed stock animals. So we're better describing the, the genetics of Angus animals, enabling uh, more informed selection decisions of breeding animals and ultimately improving the profitability of Angus genetics uh, throughout the beef supply chain. G'day, we are the Neogen Australasia Green Team. And we are part of Australia's largest local genomics lab. With team members all over the country. We've been helping Angus breeders get the best from their animals since the adoption of DNA testing. We're proud to support your benchmarking program. And looking to the future with you, with tests like our new Heifer Select. So even in times like these, when the world's gone a little crazy. We're still testing and sending results to producers every single day. So get in touch with us to discuss how genomics can take your herd to the next level. One, one sample, one simple, simple comprehensive, comprehensive solution. solution. We understand the importance of achieving the best possible outcome with assisted reproduction. That's why we at Vetequinol have created Repro360. We partner with key industry stakeholders and provide extensive resources, services and technical information. This enables breeders, veterinarians and artificial breeding companies to have a holistic and collaborative approach to livestock reproduction. We offer a range of high-end veterinary products, along with professional support and practical solutions. Our specialised services and proven products are helping maximise success with assisted breeding programs around the country. Get in touch with our friendly team today. Multiply your outcomes and benefit from a partnership for life. We now move to a more northern focus as Christian Duff discusses heat tolerance in Angus cattle. Heat tolerance is a complex area as we'll see as Christian discusses the space. Heat tolerance is an important subject that's uh, coming up regularly in conversation, uh, not just within the Angus world, but across the agricultural sector. So why is it important to understand heat tolerance and being able to, to handle heat? Um, one thing we need to understand is Angus cattle are a temperate breed. They were originated in Scotland. Um, they've been in, out in Australia for nearly 200 years now via Tasmania. Um, so there is some acclimatisation going on. In, that's for sure, in Australia compared to Scotland. However, we do need to appreciate that they are a temperate breed, a Bos taurus breed, um, compared to our Bos, Bos indicus class of cattle. Um, so the first thing is we need to understand they're, they're originated from a temperate environment and uh, that's where they're both most suited. Um, also thinking about that they are acclimatised in the Australian production system for quite a while. In regards to heat tolerance, uh, one thing we're definitely seeing is more Angus genetics heading north um, in northern Australia. The reason for that is because Angus cattle are very good in cost breeding systems, you know, for poleness, for market acceptance, for carcass quality, for fertility, for a range of things. Uh, they're obviously offers some advantages, but one thing we need to be aware of again is in northern Australia, in those tropical and subtropical climates, that uh, it's a hotter environment. So how do our temperate cattle like Angus and Angus influenced cattle handle that heat? So we really need to understand that. The other thing we need to be aware of is uh, climates, uh, and particularly the heat, is increasing over time due to climate change. Uh, scientifically proven, we're all aware of this. Um, so the average temperature is going up, but most importantly, we're seeing more extreme heat events as well. So with more extreme heat events, uh, how are our Angus and our Angus influence cattle going to handle that going forward? Uh, so that's where we need to understand this trait in more detail. 
Before we get there though, we need to think about uh, how does heat impact on beef production? So particularly if animals, beef cattle are under heat stress. So first of all, they'll reduce their feed consumption. They don't eat as much. Um, this, this will reduce their overall production, obviously, if there's quite a few heat events back, back to back, uh, increased, decreased growth rates, for example. Um, they can have lower meat quality, particularly if they have heat stress close to the point of slaughter, obviously. Um, can impact on reproductive performance in cows um, and in bulls if they're heat stressed. In extreme cases, we can obviously increase mortality, say deaths, so that's something to be aware of. All these things can, can lead into welfare implications and obviously consumer concerns if cattle aren't suited to the environment and brings in that discussion around social licence. So one thing we need to be aware of about heat tolerance though is we see variation in, the, in beef cattle. So the picture there shows the variation we probably think about, the Bos taurus compared to Bos indicus. So Bos taurus cattle generally have lower heat tolerance than Bos indicus cattle. Uh, Bos indicus cattle come and were, were originated from those hotter climates, so we expect that, and that's due to a range of internal and external factors. But what we're talking about today is the heat tolerance variation we see within the Angus breed, so within the Bos taurus breed. Um, and we know there's variation there. And the aim for this would be then, as, a, as an organisation like Angus Australia, can we describe and measure that variation where the end goal is to produce a breeding value, an EBV for heat tolerance for Angus cattle? So again, when we're setting genetics into those hotter, hotter environments or an environment is heating up itself, where we're breeding them, that we can start putting some selection pressure on this particular trait. Uh, so, so we're ahead of the game as such. There's a range of ways you can measure heat tolerance or things that are related to heat tolerance. One is Coates type score. And I'll talk more about that today because that's where we've done a bit of initial work. Uh, we can talk things like hair shedding score, which is what they do in America, and I've got the scoring system there for you. You can see that uh, a score of five would be the animals have still got their full winter coat in that coming out of uh, coming out of winter and into spring, down to one, which has a slick short summer coat. Um, that's another way you can look at uh, look at this particular trait or something that's related to this trait. You can then obviously try to measure things directly as well, like uh, temperatures of cattle, core temperatures, rectal surface temperatures. And another way you can look at it is, how, does, how is the performance of animals affected during heat events? So if you've got animals in a feed intake facility, then how is their feed intake affected when they go through a, a heat type event? And we can well describe what heat events mean, which we won't go into in detail today. So that's what we're looking at, but the initial step was to, let's just look at something we've been measuring for a while, particularly in our reference population, our soil benchmarking program, coat type, and just start getting an understanding of it. So first of all, talking about collecting coat scores, um, the first thing we'd like to mention is we've done some initial analysis of this, which I'll share with you today, but we want people to, if they're interested in this trait for themselves and their clients, to record the trait themselves and submit that if they're Angus members um, and submit it into our taste evaluation. Um, so first of all, we've got a good documentation on the website about that in the Angus Education Centre, so jump on and, and grab that document and you'll learn more about that. Um, but to describe a little bit today, we're just using a simple coat type scoring system of one to seven, where one would be extremely short, would be like our boss indicus and our tropically adapted cattle, um, very slick, very short haired. Um, two would be very short, again slick, short hair, but you could lift it a little bit up with your thumb if you, if you ring your, your, your finger along the, uh, along the animal. Three being slightly longer and slightly coarser, so you can lift the hair quite easily. Um, and four being where it's starting to curl up a little bit and, and showing a bit more coarseness and going up, up the scale from there. Um, if we're looking back at those two bulls we looked at the start, you'd see uh, the bull there with coat score two compared to a bull there with coat score four, for example. So you can see there is two examples of, of what the coat scores would look like. Um, we'll also share with you soon in this presentation uh, what sort of distribution we see in the scores we've been collecting, so you know what to sort of expect in Angus cattle if, you, if you're scoring them yourself. But I think the descriptions are fairly, fairly well descriptive. Um, in regards to scoring coat type in a bit more detail, um, if you're looking to do this coat type scoring, you would do all animals in a contemporary group on the same day with the same scorer. Um, similar to other score traits like docility or carving ears and those sorts of things. Um, in regards to the age ranges, you look to score the animals between 370 to 150 days of age. That's the analysis we're looking at at the moment. And you'd look to score the animals in late spring or early summer. So why you do the animals there is because you're looking at, at a shedding characteristic as well. Those animals 
that are losing here compared to those at Holdens and Cote. Um, and most of the scores have gone on file are in that, in that sort of range. But you need to think about adjusting that depending on the age of animals, whether you're autumn carving or spring carving. So still doing that spring or early summer, but that age range of 300 to 750 allows you to really um, do that depending, that no matter where you're carving as such. Um, in regards to uh, variation as well, it's, not in, uh, it's important that you get some variation in the scoring. So we don't want all scores too, for example. And to be honest, I've never seen a group of cattle where they're all the same score for coat type. So I, I don't think it'd be too hard to, to get some variation in all groups of cattle. Um, half scores are also allowed. So if you sort of think, oh, he sort of lies between a three and a four, or she does, um, or a two and a three, then you can put a half score in as well, and that's utilising the analysis. So first of all, in regards to what we're seeing, we've, we've analysed the data we've got on file already, and we've been collecting through our research programs and a little bit of uh, member data. Uh, so what we're up to now in regards to this research is we have analysed the coat type uh, scores we've got on file with Angus Australia, there's about 6,000 of those, mainly from our reference population program, the SIA benchmarking program. Uh, and we released those uh, research breeding values for this trade in February of 2020, so just fairly recently. Um, in regards to the 6,000 scores, you can see the, dist the histogram of the scores there. You can see that uh, we get lots of twos, two and a half, threes, uh, less one and a half and three and a half, and less, much less outside that range. So you can see what we sort of see in Angus cattle using this scoring system. Um, when we analyse that data as a single, uh, single trait, the heritability uh, was 0.25, this is just on a, on a linear type analysis, uh, 0.25, which shows that we can do something genetically with it, we can select on it and make some change over time. Um, it's similar to our heritability for yielding weight, for example, so it's, it's quite heritable in regards to a trait and we can do stuff with. We haven't uh, done a lot of research or any really in looking at genetic correlations with other traits at this stage. But that's something we'll look to do more in the future. Um, but I do have a slide to share with you uh, in this presentation, which, which does look at correlations between breeding values and selection indexes. So uh, we'll talk about that as well. So we did release a list of research breeding values for coat type uh, in February this year. And this is just the top 25 bulls in the list, but we'll scroll through the rest of them. Uh, and as you can see there in this list, we've got the ID of the bull and its name. We've got what cohort it come from, the side benchmarking program. We've got the research breeding value. We've got the accuracy of that breeding value and how many progeny that animal has coat, coat type scored. And we've also got uh, the ABI and the other ABVs listed in the report as well to, for reference. So when we're looking to interpret this particular breeding value, the thing is you need to think about is coat type Research breeding values provide estimates of genetic differences between animals and coat type, as we've described. And most importantly, if you're looking to select on it to breed particularly um, slicker, shorter hair, if that's in your breeding objective, then the lower, more negative coat type RBVs uh, indicate the animal is expected to have progeny with a shorter, slicker coat. So that's the way to do it. So you can see this particular list, the, the bulls up the top, uh, the more negative bulls, which you would expect the progeny to have shorter, slicker coats. In regards to uh, the first Australian bull on the list, the first bull was actually a New Zealand bull. Um, the second bull, which I've got a photo of, is a Watara PA Federal, and he had the most uh, negative uh, um, breeding value for coat type, um, based on a num good number of progeny, 37 and 83% accuracy, uh, relatively high in ac indexing bull as well um, to go with that. And uh, he, he would be producing um, shorter slicker coat progeny than, than other bulls. Um, lower down on the list, which would have a more positive, higher breeding value in this case. When we do start looking at genetic correlations for these particular traits, again, this isn't a, a pure genetic sense of looking at them, but what I've done here is I've just looked at the coat type research breeding value in context to the Angus breeding index. Um, and as you can see here, a bit of a shotgun approach, not a, not a strong relationship, but it is indicating there is a slight relationship of animals having a higher Angus breeding index to a lower, which means shorter, slicker genetics for coat type um, in, their, in their breeding values. Uh, again, this is early days, so I wouldn't hang the hat on these correlations, but something we'll look at in more detail as such and see what that relationship is there. So what are the next steps for this particular research and development area? Uh, first of all, we're currently developing a pipeline to deliver regular updated coat type research breeding values. And these are really there to cater for new scores coming in, either from our reference population program, but also for members who are interested in this trait and want to submit them. Um, we're looking to set up that particular pipeline so you can submit it 
and get the research breeding value back on your cattle. We're also looking to set that up as a single step type of analysis. So if anyone's actually genotyped animals through Angus Australia um, using one of our high density profiles from Zoetis or Negen, then you will also get a research breeding value prediction on those cattle as well based on the reference. So that's, that's an important step as well. And obviously one thing we're just looking at now is how do we undergo further research in this area to better understand the relationship between coat type and the end game is improving heat tolerance in Angus cattle. So that's something we're, we're looking at research partners uh, at the moment to, to look more at that, those particular traits. Really the future and where it lies is similar to where the dairy industry has got to now. Um, they've actually got, and this is an example of uh, one of the high heat tolerance breeding value bulls in the Holstein uh, breed. Um, as you can see there, it's a high indexing bull, 109's high in, in relation to heat tolerance uh, for, for dairy bulls. Um, they calculate their data primarily off the changes in production in females, so milking during heat events. Um, that's how they, they measure that trait. So obviously if a heat event comes through and a um, particular um, animal was dropped their milking compared to other ones that keep milking through, then that's, that's how they, they measure that trait. Um, so in the end, where we would like to get to as a breed is something similar where in our suite of breeding values, we've got a uh, heat tolerance breeding value as, breeding value as well, uh, like the Holstein to do. This all fits in nicely with our, obviously our Northern Development Program in Angus, Australia, um, where the overall goal is to increase utilisation of Angus infused cattle to improve the productivity and profitability in the Northern beef supply chain. Um, and an important component of that is to facilitate R&D relevant to genetics being used in the North, particularly Angus genetics. And obviously this whole heat tolerance area is a place we really need to focus on uh, to get a lot out of our Northern Development Program and to assist the industry um, um, nationally, but particularly in those, those northern hotter areas. So that's going to be really focused on collaborating in that R&D space. And that's why uh, recently we've uh, appointed a new Northern Development Officer to really progress these programs called uh, Jen Peart. And here's a short video introducing Jen Peart. Hello everybody, my name is Jen Peart and I'm the newly appointed Northern Development Officer for Angus Australia. I'm based north of Indune in central Queensland on our family owned beef cattle property. It's a commercial operation and we breed, background and finish organic cattle. I'm very excited about this role. I've always been very passionate about the northern beef industry and focused on producer profitability and production. And I really think that Angus and Angus influenced genetics have something to contribute to the northern production system. A lot of my role is supporting people who are looking to implement Angus genetics into their herds and those who are already using it. So please feel free to contact me and I really look forward to working with you. The Angus Education Centre is an initiative by Angus Australia to give our members access to information about strategies and tools that will help them explore the world leading genetic evaluation technologies to enhance the value and profitability of Angus cattle throughout the beef supply chain. Over the last 12 months, the Angus Education Centre has grown, adding modules on a range of new topics. These modules fall under three focus areas, breeding and genetics, using Angus Tech and the Northern Focus. Under each of these focus areas are a number of modules that will support members. The new modules that have been added are just the beginning for the development of the Education Centre, which will continue to be enhanced with more content to engage members. Whether just starting out or experienced in the Angus world, the Angus Education Centre is a valuable resource. The modules within the Education Centre aim to provide a journey through topic areas as members access information relevant to the module. As a bit of an example, released last year were a comprehensive series of modules on collecting performance information for both the Trans-Tasman Angus Cattle Evaluation and for Angus Research. And they really provide a great example of the Education Centre's journey approach to delivering information. These modules break down the collection guidelines into individual pages on each of the traits members can collect performance recording for, beginning with joining, birth, weaning, healing through to maturity, users of the Education Centre can follow the life cycle of the herd and the traits that can be collected at the various stages. The individual trait pages cover important information about collecting the trait with a drop down box on some of the tips to collect the trait. Users can easily print out content with the button at the bottom of the page. 
One of the biggest focus areas currently on the Education Centre covers Angus Tech and not only breaks down the features of the database such as how to search for animals or logging in but also has some valuable modules which cover some of the most commonly asked questions that we at Angus Australia receive about using the database such as generating URL links on animals or using the mating predictor. These tutorials not only provide a step-by-step -step walkthrough, but also provide a video tutorial to support the varied ways users prefer to access information. The newest area on the Angus Education Centre is under the Northern Focus and covers work out of the Northern Development Project, which provides guidelines to the relocating and ongoing management of Angus bulls in Northern Australia. Again, following the journey approach to the topic area, the module overviews the key considerations for the management of cattle in Northern Australia, such as cattle ticks, buffalo fly, and three-day sickness, before detailing some of the important considerations. The Angus Education Centre will continue to grow as new modules are added in 2020, with content focused on supporting members with resources focused on genetic gain and maximising the genetic improvement of their herd. Users are encouraged to regularly touch base with the Angus Education Centre and check out what's been added. We run 520 Angus breeding cows. You know, both our sons work for us. They're skilled operators on most machinery and that now, and they're really good around the cattle because they've been doing it since they were small kids. We at Angus Australia hear the concerns breeders raise around the direction of the breed. And whilst our focus is about empowering members to drive the direction of their breeding program, Andrew Byrne in our next session explores one of the more topical issues at the current point in time, are Angus cows getting too big? So are Angus cows getting too big? Quite a big topic in itself, pardon the pun. When we start discussing whether Angus cows are getting too big, it's important that we context this and reflect on the genetic improvement which has occurred within the Angus breed over the last 20 years. Angus breeders, both commercial and seed stock, have led the industry with the adoption of technology, be it reproductive technologies like artificial breeding, embryo transfer, or genetic improvement technologies and the adoption of performance recording and uh, utilisation of breeding values within their selection programs. And as a result of that, the Angus breed has made significant genetic improvement over the last 20 years. And there's different ways that we can measure that genetic improvement, but one of the ways we can reflect on that is to look at the change in the overall Angus breeding index that is calculated for Angus animals. And the Angus breeding index in this context reflecting the overall genetic improvement in, in the majority of, or in a common kind of production system. And at the moment, we've, we've made, and we're currently making around $3.70 per cow mated per year uh, genetic improvement in, for the Angus breeding index. Um, likewise, if in other kind of production systems, and that genetic improvement is even greater depending on the traits which impact on it. So in long-fed production systems, as reflected by the uh, heavy grain-fed index, uh, the current genetic improvement within the Angus breed is around $4.90 per cow mated per year. So it's been an outstanding achievement for, for uh, the Angus breed and it's testament to the great work of um, Angus breeders. If we look and break that down a little bit further and see, well, where has that genetic improvement actually occurred? And we can see that major the, the main reason we've made genetic improvement is effectively being able to put a lot more growth into our Angus cattle while not increasing our birth weight and therefore increasing our, um, our carbon difficulty as a result. So we've been able to really put in a, a, a lot of extra uh, growth and therefore decreasing the age of turnoff of, of Angus animals or, or making them heavier, um, depending on the production system. Um, and also made significant gains in carcass quality and, and the improvement in marbling in the Angus breed and increased profitability as a result of that um, is, is what's accounting for a lot of that current genetic improvement. But when we start to reflect on those great achievements, it's also important to see well, what has actually happened to the weight of cows um, during that time and, and what has been the consequence, I suppose, of the increased selection on growth. And if we look at the genetic trend for, for mature cow weight or what's happened within, within the um, Angus breed, we can see now there's been an increase in the weight of Angus cows of around 40 kilos 
in the last 20 years. Now, there's also been other changes in, in the weight of cows in what we see in the paddock due to changes in, in production systems. So uh, we've improved our pastures and our management and our, our animal health and things along those lines. But if we look at just the genetic component where we can break that down um, using, using technology that there's been a genetic increase of 40 kilos. So that means if we took um, Angus animals from 20 years ago and put them into current production systems, then they'd be 40 kilos lighter at, at maturity as the, the, the um, female breeding herd. Um, than current genetics, or likewise, if we took our current genetics and put them in historic uh, production systems from 20 years ago, then they'd be 40 kilos heavier. Currently, if we look at our, our rate of change, then Angus cows genetically are getting about two and a half kilos heavier each year. So it's a, a trend and that's continuing to increase in a fairly linear fashion um, as we continue our push for selection on growth. Now, is that a problem? And that's, that's where this question really comes in. So are Angus cows now starting to get too big? And it's, it's a point which is, is not a new topic and is a significant point of discussion. And there's very wide ranging views on this topic. And we do look at some of the survey work that Angus Australia has conducted over the last 12 to 24 months. This is one trait where there doesn't seem to be a very clear consensus. So we get vast ranges of, of different opinions depending on the, the individual enterprise and the individual breeding philosophies of our breeders. And Angus Australia certainly doesn't have a, a position on this at, at all. Um, but if we start thinking about, well, how do people come up with and start to consider this question, then there's some key considerations that we need to think about. On the positive side, as we increase our, our, the weight and, um, and size of our cows, then we get increased returns for surplus females. And there's certainly been some, some big prices being paid for surplus females in, in recent years. So if we start thinking about that 40 kilos, if we're, we're getting paid $2.50 a kilo, then that equates to about $100 per head extra profit from that increase in that weight. But of course, increase of weight comes at the cost of, of a whole lot of different things, and, and most particularly, the increase in the feed requirements of our mature cows. So if we consider things like a, a, an extra 40 kilos, if, if a cow is eating 2.5% um, of dry matter per day, then that equates to about an extra kilo per day of dry matter, or 365 kilos per head per year, increasing the maintenance requirements of our uh, female breeding herd. Now whether that comes at an economic cost, and what that economic cost is, really depends on our pasture utilisation. So if we've already, we're not utilising all our pasture, um, and so we're, we're producing more than we're, we're using, then we can increase our maintenance requirements and it doesn't come at any uh, significant cost. But if we're pushing, pushing the limit, pushing the envelope, um, we've got our, we're utilising most of our pasture, um, and therefore an increase in, in maintenance requirements requires us to therefore go out and source feed, it'd be through pasture improvement, or buying in supplementary feed or, or other type of techniques, then that comes at a cost and it really comes at the cost. The cost of that increase in maintenance requirements depends on um, what it costs us to, to meet that extra demand. We also have some other considerations in that we're trying to um, put extra growth into our steers, in, particularly in some long fed feedlot systems for people who are breeding for that. Um, so we need those steers to be continually growing in those feedlot systems um, and often the age of turn off in those systems is at, is at 24 months. Um, so how do we put growth into those steers and continue to increase the growth in those steers um, while not necessarily increasing our cow weight too much. There's also another, we, we talk a lot about mature cow weight, but how do we consider the effect or the correlated effect on other traits like body composition? We've increased our, our, our weight by 40 kilos, but have we also changed the body composition of our cows and what effect does that have? So there are kind of the, the considerations and I think the, the general consensus amongst Angus breeders that I talk to and that Angus Australia talks to is we really need to be trying to, to focus on continuing to put growth into our cattle to, to ultimately decrease the age of turnoff but while moderating and, and continuing to get moderate cow size. And as I said, there's a lot of different philosophies about that. But the challenge that, that I think we now have as, as an Angus breed is to start to breed what I would call the modern curve vendor. So we've made big success over the last 20 years of putting extra growth into our cattle without um, increasing the birth weight and therefore the calving difficulty. So we've bent the, the, that growth curve. Now we need to start bending it at the other end where we continue to put growth in, but hold our mature cow weight where it is. Um, also, that, that causes a whole lot, a range of different considerations and some of the other considerations as we start moving forward is do we need to be better at, at using different size for breeding replacement heifers versus those that we're, we're using to, to use our steers and, and there's a whole lot of discussion which we can have around that. So they're just some, some of the thoughts I suppose around Angus cows that are getting too big. 
If we start thinking about how we might manage that and how we might um, address that going into the future, well, if we want to do anything with managing the, the genetics of our cattle for mature cow weight, then it all depends on whether we start to measure our animals. And if we look at the current levels of measurement within the Angus breed in terms of weighing cows at, at maturity, then at the moment we have um, around just between 10 to, to 12,000 cows being weighed each year and mature cow weight sent into the Trans-Tasman Angus Cattle Evaluation, which represents about 20% of, of the cows, the breeding cows that are in the seed stock sector. And if we continue that, what we can only really describe as a very low level of recording of mature cow weight, and we're not going in and, and describing the genetics of our cattle well, then we're going to continue to increase. If we don't have a, a measurement at both a 400 day weight, 600 day weight, and then through to maturity, then there's no way that we can identify those animals which follow a, a different growth pattern and use those within our selection. We'll continue to, as we push for higher 400 and 600 day weight, we'll continue to increase mature cow weight unless we start to measure mature cow weight. The other part of this, and I touched on it before, was around um, body composition. So we start looking at um, mature cow weights, and we, we've talked about that. But what we're actually doing to body composition is also a, a consideration. So are we increasing the weight of our animals um, and, and therefore breeding uh, taller, skinnier animals or are his body composition staying the same? And to address this again, we, we need tools that enable us to, to firstly describe the genetics of animals for those traits. So we go through and we, we've now, Angus Australia has in collaboration with uh, the animal science team at the University of New England, particularly um, Dr. Tom Granlease and Dr. Sam Clark has developed research breeding values for mature cow height and mature body condition. So mature body, uh, cow body condition uh, research breeding values are now available, um, providing genetic differences in the, um, the body condition of mature females. They're, they're reported in uh, differences in score units. So if we have two animals which uh, have a um, research breeding value that is um, two, two size, for instance, research breeding value um, half a score different, then all other things being equal, we'd expect that the sire with the higher breeding value to produce um, females that on average have a quarter of a score um, more body condition. Likewise, mature cow height uh, research breeding values, we, we're now producing those genetic differences in the, the height um, of animals at, at maturity, uh, produced in centimetre units. So again, if we have uh, two sires with a research breeding value for mature cow height, that is a, a 10 centimetre difference between those breeding values, research breeding values, then we would uh, expect to see the, their daughters on average being five centimetres taller. So there's a lot of further work that, that's required in this, um, trying to really describe the, the traits around body composition um, and, and also particularly their relationship with other traits and how we might, might use those in, um, in selection. But the intention now is we've, we're starting to set up um, systems and things so that we can update those research breeding values quarterly um, and ultimately start to provide some tools to um, our Angus Australia members and, and breeders of Angus cattle in Australia uh, with the tools to go through and describe the genetics of our Angus cows for not only weight, but also a height and body con con uh, condition, which can then be used to guide our selection decisions. One of the things when we talk about research breeding values that we need to be mindful of is they are research breeding values, they are still under development and they are still subject, I guess, to some change. So while they're out there and, and um, a useful thing for people to look at, we should use them with some degree of caution. Um, all those research breeding values now can be accessed off the Angus Australia website. Um, so there's, if we go to the Angus Australia website, go to the research menu, then you'll be able to download um, a, a report with some research breeding values of size. We're also in the process of setting that up so that those research breeding values will display within the Angus database search and people will be able to search and sort as they do for the other breeding values. A key message which I'll leave you with and really want to stress this point is if we start thinking about, again, are Angus cows getting too big? Uh, have we changed the body uh, composition of our animals? The only way we can manage this going forward is if we start to record this information. So we're really putting out um, and really would urge um, all Angus Australia members who are interested in this trait, interested in selecting on it and managing it going forward, to really start to collect these measurements on your cows. So record measurements at a minimum of all your cows at weaning each year, um, so take a measurement on each cow every year, take a mature weight as a minimum, but also I really encourage you to take a body condition score and a, a hip height measurement. Um, those measurements, as I said, need to be taken, they should only be taken for cows which are weaning a calf, 
and need to be taken within two weeks of when you take the 200 day weights on those calves. You should record all measurements on the same day as much as possible um, and also if you're collecting body condition, um, make sure you're using the same scorer. Submit management group information alongside that information um, so that we can identify any, any non-genetic differences that, that might be occurred. So if there are cows which have been managed under different conditions, ensure you send in that management group information. Um, also when you submit that information, um, you can specify the time at measurement. So as I said, the, the, at the minimum we'd really like you to take those measurements when you, you're taking the 200 day weights or, or the weaning weights on those calves. For those that are really interested in assisting with this research, uh, we are interested in understanding whether this trait changes throughout the, the production cycle, so the time of year. So you also have the, the option and um, we encourage you to also submit those measurements um, either at joining or, or pre-carving and that will assist us to explain that. Um, there's also a range of different um, bits of work that we're doing now to try and describe the genetics of mature cows. So I encourage you to consider um, some of that other research um, and, and the, things like tech collecting um, structural scores on your cows, udder scores, etc. There's a whole range of information on the Angus Australia website. Um, there's also, in terms of collecting this information, the, the weight, body condition and um, height information, there's a range of resources on the Angus Australia website to help you with that. Uh, so we have collection uh, guideline documents. Um, we've also got a paddock guide for, for body condition scoring. There's also modules now available within the Angus Education Centre which will take you through all the considerations when you record this data. So again, I'd leave you with this, this question. Um, ultimately, as we, we start to go through, if we can better describe the genetics of, of Angus females for these traits, then we can start to use those in our uh, selection decisions and ultimately achieve the goal of what we're after, which is to try and breed more profitable Angus breeding females. The past 12 months for Angus Tech has seen the implementation of a number of new features to enhance the tools and technologies available to Angus breeders. Angus Tech includes a range of software tools and technologies that have been developed by Angus Australia for the utilisation of Angus Australia members and their clients. Angus Tech represents three key areas. Angus Database Search, which enables Angus breeders to search Angus Australia's comprehensive animal database. Angus Select, which captures a suite of selection tools to assist Angus breeders in improving the profitability of Angus genetics within the beef supply chain by assisting with the identification of Angus genetics that's most aligned with their breeding goals and objectives. And the recently released Angus Online. Angus Online enables Angus Australia members to interact directly with the Angus Australia Breed Registry database and complete many of the tasks that are currently undertaken by Angus Australia's member services team. Angus Database Search is the most widely used of the Angus Tech tools with a diverse group of users and to further support users of the database a number of new report options are available in the report centre. These reports are under the Detailed Animal Reports PDF and provide users with options about how they want information displayed when printing out individual animal reports. Users will also have the option to print registration certificates for registered animals using the report centre within Angus Tech. Tutorials are available in the Angus Education Centre for anyone looking for support when printing animal reports. Going forward, there'll be an increased focus on Angus Online as it's the beginning of a new way members will be able to interact with the Angus Australia database. With Angus Australia, members now able to request and manage their DNA testing with Angus Australia. And in time, Angus Online will enable members to register their animals, record animal performance information, create online sale catalogues and modify their membership details, plus so much more. The ability for members to engage directly with the database means members can track the progress of their DNA orders in real time through Angus Tech. This is a big deal as it enables members to clearly see where their testing is at and whether any results are, have been received. Members will notice the addition of the DNA services tab within Angus Tech and to track the progress of an order, members simply need to click on the tab and from the drop down box select view my order. Members will then see a list of their current and past DNA orders 
which they can select the order they're interested in to view. Once opened, the progress bar will state the progress of the order with samples in the partially complete or complete stage having results available. To view the results, members simply navigate to the appropriate tab for the testing undertaken as part of the order, where the results will be listed. Angus Online enables members to complete tasks from the comfort of their home in real time, rather than having to send information for processing by the member services team. These features are all supported by content within the Angus Education Centre and any member or their clients having trouble utilising the features of Angus Tech are encouraged to contact Angus Australia for further support. I would say a lot of the BRD that I get on my farm goes undetected. We find the best time to vaccinate is obviously at weaning and if we're trading cattle it's when they arrive on our farm. Shield MH1, you only need one. So with that we conclude the Autumn Angus Connect Research and Development Update for 2020. We hope you've enjoyed tonight's presentations. Tomorrow there'll be the series of the discussion sessions on each of the presentations given as part of tonight's event. So I encourage you if you have questions or want to discuss any of the presentations further that you uh, visit the Angus Australia website, click on the Angus Connect banner and register for tomorrow's sessions, which begin at 10 a.m. on May the 27th. So thanks very much and uh, we'll see you next time.